Then he subdued the Pisidians, who made head against him, and conquered the Phrygians, at whose chief city Gordium, which is said to be the seat of the ancient Midas, he saw the famous chariot fastened with cords made of the rind of the cornel tree, which whosoever should untie, the inhabitants had a tradition that for him was reserved the empire of the world. Most authors tell you the story that Alexander, finding himself unable to untie the knot, the ends of which were secretly twisted round and folded up within it, cut it asunder with his sword. But Aristobulus tells us it was easy for him to undo it by only pulling the pin out of the pole to which the yoke was tied, and afterwards drawing off the yoke itself from below. This was a quote from Plutarch in the book Lives, the History of Alexander. I wanted to open with this because it's one of the most famous accounts of Alexander. And as we get into the meat of the history of Alexander the Great, we're going to be talking an awful lot about Alexander as a person. And one of the things I wanted to point out, and I think is elegantly um, articulated in this quote that I just read to you, was Alexander's problem solving. He is uh, both a lateral thinker and an impatient thinker. He's a problem solver. He thinks quickly. Somebody else might have diligently tried to undo the knot and just uh, worked at it and worked at it. But of course, Alexander, in this account, either A, slices the thing open, with a sword, or B, doesn't even bother with the knot at all and simply undoes the chariot to which the knot is tied to and then just pulls the knot off the pole. Either way you look at it, Alexander is a lateral thinker, he's a problem solver, and he doesn't approach solving these problems the typical way other people do. He's one that'll um, deal with it the most direct way possible. I wanted to open with this just to give you a little taste of the character of Alexander as we dive into our story. Thank you very much, and let's get on with the show. Hello everybody, my name's Jeremy Agnew. I am the host of the Grimdark History Podcast, where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. If this is your first time tuning in, you may have been uh, watching a movie, a TV series, a, reading a book, maybe even playing a video game that set itself in a historical time or place or had part of its own lore and history, parts of our lore and history. And you may have asked yourself the question, was it really like that? How much of that was real versus them taking artistic license to tell you an entertaining story? So you may have spent some time Googling, looking around, trying to dig up, you know, what was it like? What was it really like? That type of thing. And that's what this podcast is about. We take a look at the real historical time periods and people that popular fiction pulls into itself and dig into the meat of that to try and find out what was it really like. Right now, we're doing a multi-part series on Alexander the Great, who's appeared in a lot of popular fiction. We're exploring his interactions with a lot of different people. Our focus isn't so much on battles and conquests, more along people, motives, interactions to kind of get to what were people like. That's what I was really interested in. This is episode three of a multi-part series titled The Ascension of Alexander the Great. Part one of our series was the background and history of Alexander focused mostly on his father, Philip of Macedon, 
and his mother Olympias, the state of Greece and Persia coming into the uh, eventual invasion of Alexander the Great of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. In episode two, we got to explore the religious experience of Greeks, which is an important part of Alexander's life. Divine forces were everywhere. They were a part of everyday life. And Alexander had a special relationship with divinity himself, which I dig into in episode one and we'll be digging into in more episodes in this series. This episode is going to be focused on the early parts of Alexander's consolidation of his uh, control over the Greek armies, as well as his early invasion of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. So stay tuned as we keep digging into the story of Alexander the Great, the history of the people that he interacted with, as we continue our journey on the ascension of Alexander the Great. Now, as part of my research going into this series, which I haven't really disclosed too much about, um, but I did draw, I am drawing heavily from three primary sources. That is The Life of Alexander by John Dryden, The Anabasis of Alexander by Orion, and Lives, or The Life of Alexander by Plutarch. Now, I know um, a lot of people will uh, consider at least one of my sources here very sketchy, which is fine. I actually have a deliberate reason for choosing this source, and I will get to that when I actually get into my uh, last episode in this series when I talk about uh, the actual fiction that we're drawing from here, which is the uh, historical popular fiction the Warhammer 40,000 popular fictional universe. We've been following the life of the God Emperor of Mankind, which is a character in the kind of a central figure in this popular fiction. The Emperor of Mankind, if you're not familiar with Warhammer 40,000, he's an immortal human. He pops in and out of our history, being different people, different times and places. One of the people the Emperor of Mankind is is Alexander the Great. So we're exploring the life of Alexander the Great, and I've picked my sources very specifically because they tie very closely to the popular fiction that we're, that's the theme of our first season. Now, I've drawn on several secondary sources as well. I've looked for Persian accounts. I've actually found Jewish accounts of Alexander the Great. And we'll be discussing all these different things, all these other sources that I pull from, to get little interesting tidbits of information, little different perspectives of how people felt or thought of Alexander the Great. So this is our third episode in our multi-part series on Alexander the Great, and uh, continue listening. Thanks very much, and I hope you enjoy the show. When we last left off here, our friend and hero, Alexander the Third, not yet Alexander the Great, his father, Philip II, had just been assassinated. And I left off an important... Uh, fact in that first episode in the series, more of a sin of omission. I was uh, deliberately left out because I wanted to cover it here in this episode in the opening because it relates to uh, an important thing that's about to happen. If you recall in my first episode when I talked about how Philip came to take over the throne, I said he put down a coup. Now, that's not necessarily true, and what I didn't mention here was that the person who was in charge of Macedon when Philip took over was Philip's second oldest brother. Now, I did mention that Philip had an older brother. It's Alexander II, who was the king, and he lost a battle against the city of Thebes and had to put up Philip as a uh, royal hostage. What I didn't tell you was that 
there was somebody who was very high up in the Macedonian nobility. He was the uncle of the royal family of the current kings, uh, decided to take over the throne. That was the coup. He put the second oldest child, that's Philip's second oldest brother, in charge as regent, and he ruled as a puppet king, with Philip's uncle being nominally the actual king in charge. Now, I called it a coup, and Philip putting down the coup, you could see it that way, uh, but it's because uh, Philip's older brother ends up killing the man who uh, was the regent, the one who uh, ran this coup. And there's a way to look at it as uh, Philip's older brother was killing the man who uh, assassinated his brother and he was setting things right. Or you could look at it as this is just a man who was the plaything of a younger um, king or a younger brother who wanted to be king. And when the time was right, he had set this guy up to be the fall guy to cover his assassination and taking over the throne. One way, either way you look at it, it doesn't matter to me, and I'm not here to say it was one way or the other, um, but when Philip puts down the coup that I talked about in the first episode, Philip was taking the throne from his older brother. And you remember I told you that Philip was put as regent for the king who was too young, small boy, while the actual king of Macedon was away, and he died, and Philip kills the child. What I didn't tell you was that child was Philip's nephew. A small boy, too young to rule on his own. What would that take to be somebody so cold that you could kill a small child in order to take the throne? That's some of the ruthlessness that was part of Philip of Macedon, part of Greek culture and Macedonian culture, part of Persian culture part of Egyptian culture. It was all around um, the Mediterranean, this, this type of ruthlessness. Um, now, it didn't always come out that way, but it was this way. And I waited till now to talk about this because when Philip is assassinated, well, Alexander isn't automatically king. There is another heir to the throne. Alexander has a younger brother. If you recall, I mentioned that Alexander and his mother Olympias were put on the outs for a while. Philip had got another wife who was uh, a member of Macedonian nobility a very important ally to Philip in his upcoming conquest. And there were comments made during the marriage, the celebration of the marriage, that um, Philip could produce a proper heir. And Philip doesn't immediately shut this down, even though Alexander's the obvious heir. He's the, currently the only living male. And even if Philip has another child, Alexander's the oldest living male who would, by all accounts, make him heir to the throne. And when Philip doesn't shut this talk down, Alexander takes that personally and it puts him in Olympias, part of many other things that happened on the outs. Philip has to protect his alliance this marriage that he just made for political purposes. So you can see a situation where, uh, you know, he makes a marriage alliance. Yeah, yeah, let's get married. Your wife, even though she's my, my third or fourth wife, don't worry any children we have. They'll be the heirs. 
and you can maybe see an agreement that happens behind closed doors. You can see this Macedonian noble maybe wanting to make the silent agreement a little more public and saying this out in the open and not getting immediately shut down would certainly raise some questions as to who Philip would have wanted to be the heir to the Macedonian throne. Well, when Philip dies, Alexander has a younger brother through this brand new marriage that had happened. And a couple of things happen very shortly after the assassination. The first thing that happens is the assassin is hunted down and killed almost immediately. They don't even capture him alive to be able to question him and find out what happened, who did it, was it Persian um, gold, did somebody buy an assassin? Was there other motives behind it? Was it Olympias? Was it a spurned lover? Was it somebody who uh, was raped and not protected by the king taking vengeance? There's a lot of um, kind of who killed JFK theories surrounding this assassination. It's not important to the story. What's important is that the assassin is killed, and then there's a question left out in the open, hanging in the air, of did Olympias have anything to do with this? People maybe who didn't believe it, but wanted to put a question mark on Alexander's legitimacy. This would be ammo for them, whether they believed it or not, to put a question on his legitimacy to the throne. Now, because there was another heir and Alexander was already on the outs with Philip, it doesn't necessarily mean Alexander was automatically king right then and there. In fact, there was already, even hours or minutes after the death of Philip, other conflicting generals who were in control of the army that maybe didn't necessarily believe that Alexander should be king. We're going to be talking about the relationships of various peoples to Alexander. One of the most important ones is the relationship of Alexander and one of his generals, a man by the name of Parmenion. Parmenion was the chief military advisor of Philip. He was a friend and confidant. He was a noble. He had fought multiple battles with Philip. They were friends. They were confidants. He was a trusted advisor. And Parmenion was the first general that we're aware of that supported Alexander's claim to the throne. In fact, before Alexander had even done anything to secure his claim to the throne, Parmenion had already killed off a couple of rival generals in order to consolidate Alexander's power. Alexander um, could easily have been killed right then and there if not for Parmenion's support for Alexander's claim. Because of this, Alexander would place Parmenion highest above anybody else in his army. He was a trusted advisor of his father, and because of his unquestioning and immediate support of Alexander's claim, Alexander considered Parmenion one of his most trusted advisors. He was the second most powerful man in Macedon after Alexander. He was put in control of an army of his own right. He would have access to the Persian treasury. He protected Alexander's critical supply lines. This is the man who controlled the food and the money that kept the armies pumping as Alexander made his way into India. 
So Parmenion's an important character. Remember that name. It's going to come up again later in our story here. But Parmenion's um, assassination of rival generals helped consolidate Alexander's power and guarantee his unquestioning access to the throne and his legitimacy as king. But there's one more wild card that I talked about, and that is Alexander's younger brother, a baby by the name of Carinus. Carinus was the uh, child there that I was talking about at the start, the issue and result of the political marriage between uh, Philip and the Macedonian noble that question Alexander's legitimacy. Alexander has his infant brother murdered, as well as the mother, Cleopatra, also murdered. And there's some question as to whether or not it's Alexander, whether it's Olympias, whether it's other people acting on Alexander's behalf or in the best interests of Alexander. There's also a question out there of, is this person even an actual legitimate son of Philip? Would Alexander have even cared that a baby existed? Would be more likely that a teenager would be more of a threat to the throne, somebody who's close to adulthood? So there's questions there as to whether or not this is a real legitimate threat to Alexander, whether he was a legitimate heir to the Macedonian throne even. But this is a story that's out there. And so I'm repeating it here as also letting you know that it's not set in stone that this was fact. But I talk about it now because I mentioned at the start that it takes a certain level of ruthlessness to kill your own nephew who is an infinite. That's what Philip II did in order to take his throne. He killed the person he was regent for. And that's not, um, you know, just an everyday thing. When you are regent, you take an oath to look out for this child. You make decisions in the best interest of this child. And breaking that oath is a huge no-no. But that's what Philip did. That's what he did in order to take the throne. And Alexander does almost the same thing. He's not regent for an infant. And he's not killing his nephew. He's killing his younger infant half-brother. Now, I, whether he did it on his own, somebody who did it on his behalf, in his best interests and heart, again, those are all up in the air. But this is something that I wanted to talk about and just let you know it's out there and it exists. Now another thing happens when Alexander consolidates his power and becomes the acknowledged king of Macedon. Now again, uh, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't cover in episode 1 when we were talking about Philip because our topic is Alexander. But I'm going to talk on one thing briefly because it's important to our story of Alexander. And that is uh, Philip's conquest of Thrace. Now I did mention that Thrace uh, exists. It's much bigger at this time than it is today. Thrace extends um, up into Bulgaria and parts of Ukraine at this time. Philip conquers most, if not all, of Thrace, all the way up into Bulgaria. He quadruples the size of Macedon by doing just this one thing. Now, all of Thrace isn't conquered. Chunks of it are free, and chunks of it that Philip would write on his map, you know, the, the king drawing the borders of his kingdom... You ask the Thracians where Macedon stops and their kingdom still persists, you're going to get conflicting borders drawn there. But Philip conquers huge chunks of Thrace. 
he creates some governors of the existing Thracian nobility who govern and acknowledge Macedonian rule. They pay Macedonian taxes. They submit tithes of their populace to be part of Philip's army. So Philip controls huge chunks of Thrace. Now, when Alexander becomes king, that doesn't necessarily hold true anymore. There are people that always want to take opportunity during a succession crisis. There is a lawful lot of Greek city-states that would like to be free from Macedonian control. There are huge chunks of Thrace that didn't want any part of Philip's kingdom. So there is a succession crisis of recently conquered areas breaking off and testing the waters of Philip's, or pardon me, of Alexander's control over the uh, Greek city-states and the army that he has. So Alexander isn't able to just immediately pick up where Philip left off and go marching into Persia. Alexander has to consolidate his control over Thrace. So he takes his army and marches it up into the Thracian kingdom lands. He uh, this would be the Odrysian kingdoms at this time. He conquers uh, a few of the city-states there. He um, slaughters a whole bunch of people. I'm not going to talk about all the battles. Again, when I was talking about how I'm going to do this show, it was not going to be about the battles. It was going to be about the people and his relationships with the people. And the relationship here that I want to point out is that Thrace is not or does not see itself as part of Macedon. They are not a willing participant in this battle. Now, there are Thracian nobilities, Thracian noblemen, noble houses that see being part of Macedon as an opportunity to increase their own power. They can get rich, increase their lands. And maybe they'll have a chance to break away or made governor of larger parts of Thrace. All these things. There's, there's lots of little power games at play. So Alexander has to push the pause button on his invasion of Persia in order to deal with these Thracians. And while he's away... Now, if you remember, I talked about the city of Thebes. They come back into our story here. In part one of our series, the city of Thebes gets the better part of Alexander II. That's Alexander's uncle, who was king of Macedon. They're the ones that beat the Macedonian army. They're the ones that forced uh, Macedon to give up a royal hostage. They're the ones who took Philip in, gave him education, raised him, and then sent him on his way back to Macedon once the uh, agreement was done. Thebes is the most powerful city-state when Philip turns around and conquers them as part of his conquest of the Greek city-states. Now, it wasn't just Philip that conquered Thebes. Alexander was part of that battle. Alexander was in charge of the Macedonian cavalry. Now, you may have heard of the sacred band of Thebes. That was a special kind of elite unit in the Theban army, made up entirely of uh, Theban men and their loving partners. The theory being that a man will fight harder when he's got his lover standing next to him it's hard not to disagree with that i mean how many of us would choose to run versus choose to stay and fight if we knew our loved one was in uh, threat of dying 
So the Sacred Band of Thebes, as it's known, was the elite special forces unit. And I talk about them briefly because in this battle, when Macedon conquers Thebes, Alexander, in control of the Macedonian cavalry, charges headlong into the Theban sacred band, and he slaughters them all. This is one of Alexander's uh, defining moments as a young general and soldier making his name as a prince of Macedon. So Thebes was not at all happy to be under the thumb of Macedon. They're not part of the alliance. They're an unwilling partner. They've been conquered, like Thrace was conquered. And when Philip dies, and Alexander is away in the northern wastes of Thrace, in Bulgaria somewhere, fighting tribes of people running around. They start a rumor, or rumor gets back, that Alexander's dead, that there's no king. And the city of Thebes take this as an opportunity to declare independence of their own. And they try to encourage other city-states who maybe, who maybe aren't so sure about this Macedonian alliance to break off as well. There's no more Philip, there's no more Alexander, he's dead, his army's destroyed in the northern barbarian lands of Thrace somewhere. And when I say barbarian lands, I am talking about them as the way Greeks would think and talk about them. Anybody who didn't speak Greek was barbarian, just like how uh, Romans and later have the same attitude. So Alexander's dealing with now threats on multiple fronts. He's got his um, Thracian borderlands that are he needs in place in order to move his army into Persia. He's got to settle that, get that back under control. And while he's away in this northern wilderness, running down uh, these rebel tribes... The city of Thebes, the greatest Greek city in the time, they break away and declare independence. And they start a rumor that Alexander's dead. Well, this gets back to Alexander, and as Alexander finishes locking down Thrace, he turns around and has to press pause on the uh, invasion of Persia yet again. And he has to go back to Thebes, the city that he was instrumental in conquering just a decade earlier. Or probably not a decade earlier, just a few years earlier. The man who broke the Theban sacred band, their elite forces, he would have a reputation of being somebody you do not mess with. And this is the man that turns around and takes the entirety of the Persian invasion army and surrounds the city of Thebes. Now there are a lot of pressures that come with being a king, especially the king of Macedon who's only managed to acquire the loyalty of several Greek city-states through threat of violence and permanent presence of Macedonian army in their lands. There's another pressure pouring on Alexander, pushing him down, and that is you must pay an army in order to keep it in the field. You have to feed it. You have to pay them. You have to replace sick and injured people. Alexander uh, and his father before him have leveraged all their wealth in building this army that's supposed to be invading Persia and taking Persian wealth for themselves. Now, at the time of the siege of Thebes, 
Alexander is already in the second, pardon me, Alexander is already in the second year of his reign, and he doesn't have any wealth to show for it. It's hard to pay an army and keep them happy and in the field of battle when they're not getting paid. So we have Alexander and his giant army who spent a year and a half in Thrace quelling that rebellion, not getting much wealth out of that, and then marching the entire of the army back down, keeping the pause button pushed on the wealth and invasion of Persia to go and deal with the Theban city-state revolts. And as Alexander's army pulls through, several of the city-states that Thebes managed to uh, convince to rebel find themselves lacking courage when faced with the reality of an army 30,000 plus strong outside their city gates. And Alexander riding before that army. The reality is it's one thing to talk a big game, but it's another to put up when there's an army outside your gates. And Alexander finds, uh, like his father Philip did, that the threat of an army outside your gates is just as good at getting peace and getting people in line. So a bunch of the revolting city-states just bend and capitulate and fall back in line. Sparta sends an army to support Thebes. But when they see the size of Alexander's army, they realize that they are inadequately prepared. And there's no point in dying. So they turn around and leave Thebes to its fate. Now, Thebes is important to Alexander. It's one of the most powerful city-states. It's a symbol in its own right. You know, if we talked about, if you were with me when we were talking about our history of the destruction of the Tower of Babylon, not everybody who invaded and conquered the city of Babylon wanted to destroy it. They wanted to keep their Babylon nice and shiny. It's a prestige thing to be able to claim you have some control over this and there's wealth and taxes there you don't want to destroy your piggy bank so alexander has this same feeling about thebes we have this pressure uh pressure valve of an army that needs to get paid that has spent two years not getting the expected pay it was supposed to be getting we're surrounded the city of Thebes and we send our emissaries out there begging for the city of Thebes to give up and they are sticking their foot in the sand. They are the ones who are putting up and, shut and not shutting up. They're putting their money where their mouth is. Let me mix my metaphors some more for you. They do not bend. In fact, they mock Alexander and so Alexander has an opportunity to kill three birds with one stone he can get his army paid he can put down this uppity rebellion in the middle of all his most important allies send a permanent message that's going to be a sting nobody forgets. What happens when you cross the king of Macedon? You remember the message I talked about in our episode one of the destruction of the Tower of Babylon. We talked about the reality of what it means when a city is sacked. We talked about the uh, Babylonian destruction of the siege of Jerusalem. They completely razed the city after a two-year-long siege, give or take a few months. Talked about what that was like for the people inside the city. You can go back and listen to episode one of the destruction of the Tower of Babylon 
if you'd like to understand that experience that's about to befall the city of Thebes. But Alexander does the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar II did to Jerusalem. Alexander burns and raises the entire city to the ground. He destroys Thebes thoroughly. He enslaves the entirety of the population. Thousands of Greeks, estimated to be approximately 30,000 men, women, and children. Now, just being enslaved would be bad enough. But remember what I told you about what it means when a city is sacked. And the city of Thebes and its inhabitants had to suffer the humiliation, the degradation, and the violence that would happen during a sacking, torture, rape, theft. All that and more can and did happen during Alexander's destruction of the city of Thebes. The army would loot the city, get paid, they would um, get 30,000 slaves they could send wherever they wanted, do with whatever they wanted. The slaves had no rights. Now there is a bittersweet story in and amongst the destruction of Thebes. This is from uh, the book Lives by Plutarch. Plutarch tells the story of a Theban noblewoman, a woman by the name of uh, Timoclea or Timoclea, however you pronounce that. She's a noble in the city as it's being sacked. And as a bunch of Alexander's army ransacks her home, her husband's dead, they rape her. And then after they're done raping her, they force her to tell them where she's hid her jewelry and wealth. And so she leads them to the well in their yard. And as one of Alexander's army leans over the well to peek down to see if there's any treasures there, she pulls a uh, this is Sparta moment. She kicks the person down the well. In some versions of the story, she throws rocks on him while he's down there before she, the rest of Alexander's uh, army that is, that's there pulls her away. They take her in front of Alexander, and he uh, gives her a pass. That's the story. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Um, you know, the sacking is a horrible thing. So there's a little bit of bittersweet revenge that at least one person in the city of Thebes was able to pull out of that horrendous nightmare. So Alexander has put down the Theban revolt. He sent a message to all the other Greek city-states. What happens if you cross Macedon, a message of utter ruthlessness. And if you'll remember in my episode one of this series, I talked a little bit about the Peloponnesian Wars and the Malayan Dialogue and the Athenian massacre of the city of Milos. The strong do what they will and the weak have to suffer it. Well, this is Alexander. And you can guarantee yourself that Alexander would have read the Peloponnesian uh, Wars, the history of the Peloponnesian Wars by Thucydides. He would know the Malayan Dialogue well. This is a message Alexander is saying to the rest of the Greek city-states and everybody else out there that this news is going to get to. What happens if you cross Macedon? Do not do that. So Alexander's released the pressure valve in his army. He's got them paid. We've sacked Thebes, got money, wealth, slaves, 
We sent the message to the rest of the Greek city-states, got everybody in line. And now, and now finally, uh, we're ready for Alexander to invade Persia. One of the things I wanted this episode to be about was people and how different people thought of each other and interacted with each other because it paints an interesting story about how the, the myth and legend of Alexander the Great might have been a lot different. One of those relationships is the relationships between Greeks and Persians. Now, from Alexander's perspective, or at least the perspective being told to the other Greeks, the perspective that was sold to them by Philip, was that the invasion of the Persian Achaemenid Empire was to free the Greek colonies that were under Persian control and had been for hundreds of years. Now, I talked about briefly in the episode one of this series, and the background was the Greco-Persian Wars. A lot of people know about the Battle of Thermopylae, Battle of Salamis, things like that, Marathon. But they're in between, those are major battles, but in between all of that, there's a lot of little independent small-time warfare happening. I mentioned the Athenians as they become the Empire of Athens and being the head of the Delian League attack several uh, Persian-controlled Greek colonies to nominally free them. I mean nominally free them. Free them means coming under at least Greek-Athenian control. Some of them will throw the yoke off. They will have independent rebellions against the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire is such a giant, huge machine. The awareness of the king of Persia as to all of this that is happening is in question. Whether or not the king of Persia knows or even cares about these little teeny rebellions is uh, up in the air. In fact, it is entirely possible that he is entirely focused on his own campaigns in India. India is a wealthy, wealthy land. It's the one of the reasons Alexander will take his army there. And the Persians have been trying to capture parts of this so they can get this wealth along with uh, the wealth of Babylon and some of those other places all together. And if you have a choice between sending your army east and fighting a bunch of uh, little Greek city-states that aren't doing a whole lot for you money-wise versus sending your army to the west and conquering chunks of incredibly wealthy land and resources in India, which would you choose? I know what I would choose. I know where I would invest my time and effort. And I would leave the little border skirmishes to the local governors. And there's lots of stories of that happening. In preparation for this series, one of the books I read was called Darius the Great, Ancient Ruler of the Persian Empire. It was published in uh, 2018 by Warsaw Press. The author was Jacob Abbott. It's a good read if you're looking for something um, short and sweet as a summary of one of the kings that were involved in the Greco-Persian Wars. I read this uh, to help gain some Persian perspective of um, you know, Greco-Persian Wars and uh, the influences as the Persians felt about the Greeks. I'm going to tell you the story of Orites and Polycrates. This comes from uh, Jacob Abbott's Darius the Great, the book that I was talking about in my introduction, one of my uh, primary sources here. 
when I'm looking for Persian accounts of how they interact with Greek people and, you know, any sort of insights of how they thought of each other. You know, the popular theory is that, um, you know, Greek city-states uh, feared Persians. They were always fighting them, didn't want to be in uh, work with them. You know, this sort of thing is, it's usually a us versus them scenario. As usual, uh, it's much more nuanced than that. Persians themselves really didn't care who was running uh, a government so long as they got um, their tithes. The story of Orates and Polycrates is a fairly straightforward one. Orates is a Persian governor in uh, Lydia. That's kind of a uh, northwestern province of Anatolia. Orites is a governor and he takes it on himself to attack the king Polycrates, who is the king of several islands, the principal of which is the island of Samos. These are one of the islands that are involved in the uh, um, Greco-Persian wars, and this is an account of it. And, you know, depending on which account you're reading, you're going to get a different side to the story. The Persian side of the story is that Orites um, was operating on his own. He was actually goaded into attacking Polycrates of Samos by another governor who was making fun of him because he really didn't have any um, glory or stories of war on his own. And he convinced Orites that if you attack and take the island of Samos, that'll earn you some glory and you'll get more respect from the other governors. Now, Polycrates is incredibly rich. He has a large navy. He's conquered several of the surrounding islands to Samos. So he has uh, quite a significant chunk of the Aegean. He controls trade routes and he has a relationship even with the direct relationship with the current king of Egypt. Now uh, Orites r does not want to directly attack Polycrates. You know Polycrates has a big navy, he's got a uh, you know significant uh, military force and it's not easy to attack an island fortress uh, even modern times so Orites writes to Polycrates and says you know let's invest and partner up and we'll attack some of the surrounding islands together and we can jointly work together and we can both be wealthy and Polycrates um, not only does he uh, like this idea, he dives right into this. So this tells you that there is a uh, relationship between Greeks and Persians that is much more nuanced and complex than uh, Persian good, Greek bad, or vice versa. Different Greek people and different Persian people will have different opinions of each other uh, throughout the decades and generations. But at the supposed height of the uh, Greco-Persian Wars, here is a Greek king, a ruler in his own right, partnering up with a Persian governor. And the king of Persia isn't even aware that this is happening. Orites supposedly tricks Polycrates, shows up, gets uh, imprisoned, gets killed. Orites takes over chunks of Samos. You know, there's this going back and forth. And Jacob Abbott writes that it's doubtful whether or not Darius would have even have been aware that this was happening. Unless something directly affected the king of Persia was generally not brought to their attention. The central government, and again quoting Jacob Abbott, the central government in this ancient empire generally interested itself very little in the contentions and quarrels of governors of the provinces. 
provided that the tribute was efficiently collected and regularly paid. So this is just a little tidbit here, a little teardrop or a little, oh, again, here I am mixing metaphors, but a little piece of information, a little slice of Greco-Persian interaction, and that even though Orites portrays uh, Polycrates, Polycrates is not immediately suspicious of Orites. This is not a Greek person who immediately rejects any sort of Persian um, interaction, partnership, working together. In fact, it was welcomed. This should tell you a little bit that the Greco-Persian wars were not so uh, me good, you bad, that type of thing. It's much more nuanced. Alliances are flipping back and forth. And a Greek colony wasn't necessarily opposed to being either in partnership or being under the governorship of Persia. And that's not to say that it was always the case. Again, this is a nuanced conversation. And as much as there would be uh, a Polycrates willing to work with an Orates, there was Greek colonies that rebelled against Persian control and wanted to be on their own, and that was happening too. They traded back and forth. There was things like this happening all along during the Greco-Persian Wars. It's such a huge kingdom, the king itself, himself, is not even aware of what his little fingers and independent governors in these city-states are doing. So the Greco-Persian Wars are often fought completely independently of the Persian king. You know, you listen to the Greeks' perspectives, this is a, a life-threatening situation being, um, you know, the Persian Empire on their borderlands. And yet, from the Persian perspective, it's not even a blip on the radar of one of the greatest kings of Persia during the height of the Greco-Persian Wars. It doesn't even know. It doesn't even register as something that would come as, as an update on what's happening in the eastern provinces of his kingdom. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of, of at least the perspective of how important um, or even how much of a threat they consider Greece to be, at least at the time of Darius, you know, just a few generations before Alexander is about to invade. Greek doesn't even, Greece, pardon me, doesn't even really register on their radar as something that's important even though all these little um, um, rebellions are happening. It's just the local governors that are dealing with. They don't even bother the king with it. And yet at the same time, Anatolia is a massively um, huge melting pot of cultures. Greek people are just one of among dozens of cultures and people living in Anatolia. And the Persians um, make use of Greeks just as often as Greeks make use of Persians. The Persians will hire uh, Greek mercenaries. You can read the story of Xenophon, who uh, was a, a Greek commander who led a huge army um, into Persia. He was hired by the, one of the Persian kings. He got tricked into fighting for a rebellion and he had to fight a huge retreat across the entirety of the Persian Empire, across uh, Thrace and trying to get back to Greece. It's an interesting read if you want to read that and that might come back as a later story in this series at some point. But Persians were not above using Greeks as part of their army. They hired soldiers, they hired generals to lead the armies. They worked alongside other Persian generals and governors. So this was a place that saw um, Greeks not necessarily as equals, but they did see them as intelligent and capable 
military commanders and they were used as such and hired as such. And Greeks often didn't think one way or the other about um, being hired by Persians. Spartans took Persian gold during the Peloponnesian War to help defeat the Delian League and the Athenians. The Corinthian League that follows that took Persian gold again to help defeat the Spartans. This is happening back and forth for generations, and this is just, you know, day in, day out. One day you're, you're my friend, the next day you're not. It's a interesting melting pot along the Anatolian Mediterranean coastline because there's a lot of little Greek colonies, existing people that would be the remnants of the Hittites and the people that the Hittites conquered. So there'd be the Phrygian kingdoms would be coming about. Things like that that would be happening, you know, from the Bronze Age beforehand, there have been Greek colonies integrating with and trading with and merging cultures with the rest of the um, people that lived in Anatolia and Mesopotamia and then Persia. Now, an interesting thing to think about, one of those little uh, what-ifs, one of those little counterfactuals that people like to throw around in their heads, is a Greek general by the name of Memnon of Rhodes, who was a prominent commander in the Persian Empire, and the first one to face Alexander the Great. Now again, I don't want to be about the battles. I'm not going to talk about the battles other than as background for the people and how people interacted and thought of each other. So this is Alexander the Great facing Memnon of Rhodes at the head of one of the uh, Persian Empire armies. Now, how... Memnon of Rhodes wanted to deal with Alexander was probably the way they should have dealt with Alexander. We know Alexander, at least from the documentation we have in the books that have been written about him, I talked about him releasing that pressure valve on his army during the sacking of Thebes, getting them paid a little bit. He went to... Uh, invade Persia two years after you know, he should have been there. So he's two years behind on pay. And he uh, you know, released that pressure valve a little bit during the sacking of Thebes. But he's really looking to get paid and make his money during the actual invasion of Persia. This will be when they can really let the pressure valve off. We don't need to hold back. We can sack and take whatever we want. That's how armies operated as they moved during this time. Alexander's army, at least according to the books that I've read, had a month or less of food and pay before they were going to run out as he begins his invasion. And you know, just because you begin, you know, day one, you're not making money on day one of your invasion. You still got to march weeks to meet the opposing army. You've got to, um, you're not going to run into cities that are fabulously wealthy right away. Some of them you're going to have to siege and that could take weeks, maybe even months. So there's a lot of iffiness and and uh, stress and pressure on Alexander and his army as they move into Anatolia and begin the actual invasion proper. Now Memnon, who's uh, one of the Greek generals leading the initial defense force against Alexander's invasion, there are other Persian generals actually in charge. Memnon's a military advisor. He will lead the armies, but um, ultimately the command falls on the Persians. Persians, much like Greeks, believed in meeting battles head-on. Let's get stuck in. Let's uh, decisively settle this and achieve glory. Memnon was smart. 
he saw the size of Alexander's army. By now, the Macedonian phalanx has a well-known reputation for being a deadly force. And Alexander's recognized, at least by now, as being a competent general that's able to move his army fast, deal with problems fast, and there's a well-trained and tuned army that's already fought several battles. It's battle-tested. Memnon looks at the size of his army, understands that we're not really ready to take on that army, and he advises a scorched-earth policy. He wants to burn the fields, take all the food, evacuate the settlements in front of Alexander's army, which is going to be slow-moving, and his advice is, let's burn the field, scorched earth, let's retreat, and Alexander's army is going to peter out, they'll starve to death, and then they'll disappear, and nobody has to die. Now the Persians, though that's he's advising, like I said, they don't see it this way. There's glory to be had, and on top of that, there is the pressure of the king of Persia, weighing down upon them. Persia is just recovering from a civil war. Well, not really a civil war, but multiple coups that have happened. There's a lot of um, what you would call um, pressure uh, to perform and be seen as a strength, not something that you can uh, just push around. You know, there's been multiple coups inside the Persian royal house leading up to this. The Greeks don't realize this, but this is actually what's happened. And so feeling that pressure to perform, to she, to be a show of strength and stability is um, part of the motivation that the Persians use. And they decline Memnon's advice and they stick it out for a fight, they lose. Not going to go into that. But it's interesting that right here at the start of the invasion, there was a chance, an interesting counterfactual. We know Memnon of Rhodes advised his Persian commanders to just let scorched earth, let's let them peter out, and Alexander's army would be gone in under a month because they would have starved to death and they would have had to leave otherwise. And you have to wonder if the Persian Empire itself hadn't undergone multiple coups in just a few decades leading up to this, if there wasn't that pressure to have a show of strength, again, from a king who, who wouldn't even register the Greeks, as a blip on his radar, would he even have cared if they had just burned a few villages and settlements and took their foods and let Alexander's army petered out? This isn't a place of a lot of wealth right now. The wealth is in Mesopotamia. The wealth is in Egypt. The wealth is in India. That's an interesting thing, and it shows a little bit about the character of the Persian Empire as Alexander invades, the pressure to be seen as strong rather than to um, necessarily do the right thing, the pressure to perform under the threat of uh, you know, a king whose rule was already tenuous. Anyways, this is a little bit of an interesting story here, the, the story of Memnon of Rhodes as the advisor to the Persian army. Had they followed his advice, there would be no Alexander the Great. He just would have been Alexander III, another king of Macedon, and there would be uh, no destruction of the Persian Empire, at least not under Alexander's time. Anyways, just a, a little interesting tidbit of uh, Persian culture and influence amongst the Greeks, amongst 
internally the Persian army themselves and the government as Alexander invades. Now after this first battle, which no surprise to anybody listening, Alexander wins. This is called the Battle pardon me, this is called the Battle of Granicus. If you want to look that up, there's lots of detail about that, uh, about how the armies moved. You know, if you're interested in how armies fought, you can find details about the Battle of Granicus. But after this, this is the first major battle. He crushes um, the initial defense force that was assembled in time to face Alexander. This isn't um, the only battle he fought here. It takes Alexander a year to consolidate his control of just Anatolia. He has to march his army all over the place, and he splits his forces up into a, a couple of different spots. You know, he sends somebody north, sends somebody south. You go to Cappadocia, you go to Phrygia. We got to siege some cities here and there. Now, Alexander's um, a couple of things, and one of the things that I think is revealed about the character of Alexander is that he is an impatient person. But he does not let his impatience um, negatively affect his military uh, strategic decisions. In fact, um, he's quite intelligent in terms of military strategy and how to move armies around and how to achieve larger goals as quickly as possible. He's a lateral thinker, and his lateral thinking combined with his impatience lets him make quick decisions that are out of the box, unexpected, and solve problems that people uh, don't immediately see the solution to or don't even immediately realize as a problem. So one of the things that will become a struggle between Alexander and his impatience and his lateral thinking, his solving of problems quickly, is, his, uh, is how this will conflict with his Greek commanders who don't have the same multicultural uh, problem-solving attitudes that Alexander has. And I say multicultural, it's not that Alexander treated everybody as equals. Alexander uh, definitely um, understood how uh, treating people as your betters or your equals or your lessers was an important part of at least enforcing uh, structure in and amongst his army. Uh, but Greeks themselves, um, the mainland Greeks that Alexander had as part of his army, as well as some of the older school Macedonians, had an attitude very much of Greek only, Greek first, Greek always. Even at the expense of um, faster resolution, it was better to always be Greek first. Alexander um, understood Greek first was important, but Alexander's impatient, and Alexander's a lateral thinker, and Alexander can recognize competence in people. So Alexander uh, does not think twice about, um, you know, let's leave this non-Greek person in charge if it will solve the problem and we don't have to fight a battle and we can just move on. The Greeks would rather, let's fight the battle, let's show them what it means to defy Greek, and then let's move on. And there's a conflict of that that will come up over and over and over again, and it starts to show its head here. There are, as I said, other nations living in and amongst Anatolia, and Alexander will treat with and um, enter into diplomatic agreements with some of these city-states, some of these non-Greek cultures. 
you will negotiate or agree to terms with them that leaves them in control over significant chunks, and in some cases strategic chunks, as long as they don't have to fight a battle. So he'll, he'll leave somebody who's not Greek in charge of a significant um, supply line. Now he will make that person ultimately uh, the subordinate of a Greek governor who will control larger chunks of the province. But, um, you know, it takes weeks or days for news to travel in and amongst this mountainous region if when we're moving inland from the coastline. And while all this is happening, there are smaller Persian armies moving around. And Alexander splits his forces a few times. There are other Greek generals in his army in control of some of these forces that help prevent uh, Alexander's army from getting picked off in parts. They'll have lesser generals that aren't part of the Alexander the Great myth, but are no less part of Alexander's army. And if these battles weren't won by other Greek generals, there probably might not be an Alexander the Great to talk about. But some of these battles are happening in this year-long initial campaign. And while this is happening, remember I told you Alexander's army had less than a month of supplies. Well, how does an army feed itself? It feeds itself on the food and the wealth and the arms and the people that exist in and amongst these settlements, villages, and cities as his armies move through Anatolia. Some of them will be recognized as Greek colonies. They will not put up a fight, and Alexander will pass on by. Let's not sack this place, guys. It's one of us. Let's move on to the neighboring person who is not a Greek city. We'll sack them. And some of these places will send emissaries out. And this is one of the primary ways Alexander conquered as much land as he did, as quick as he did. Anatolia is a huge province. You can't fight. If, every, if Alexander had to siege every city, he would still be talking about Alexander today. And he'd still be trying to siege a city t today in Anatolia. So um, some of these cities, even though they knew... They could hold out for weeks, maybe even months, against Alexander. They knew that they could not beat Alexander. Some of them didn't even have walls, and some of them, the walls were more meant to keep out small-time little raiders, not a determined army with siege equipment. So as Alexander's army moved into the area, he would send emissaries out to the larger cities requesting that they surrender some of them will proactively reach out to alexander and send emissaries to him here's some gifts and we surrender and alexander and as alexander's army moves through these areas some of these cities will have already surrendered and what that means is that your city doesn't get sacked and just because your city doesn't get sacked doesn't mean you don't get a bad end of the deal. It just means the deal you get isn't as bad as the deal that the person whose city was sacked got. It means Alexander's army moves through. They still take whatever they want. They take whatever they need. If they need to take half their able potted men as slaves or carriers or as uh, people to help in the army. If they need to take your wealth, if they need to take your food, if they need to take your donkeys, mules, cattle, oxen, horses, goats, whatever it was, they just took it. Now your city wasn't destroyed. Not everybody was raped and tortured. Not everybody was just sold into slavery like the city of Thebes. So this is how Alexander's army fed itself. This is how every army fed itself as it moved through foreign lands it was invading. It's not unique to Alexander. I think it's important to point that out. But remember, Alexander's army had less than a month's supply coming in. 
Already lots of back pay due. So as Alexander's army splits up and conquers chunks of Anatolia, huge portions at a time, as some of these places are surrendering, Alexander's army is taking what they need. That will include, at times, slaves, replacement soldiers, food, beasts of burden, all that, anything the army could want that's being taken from them. Now, you were lucky if you were a Greek colony because Alexander would be more gentle with the Greek colonies. And he had Greek allies in and amongst his army. And again, the uh, purpose of the invasion, at least what was told to them, the purpose of the invasion was freeing these Greek city-states from Persian control. So it would look awfully bad as the head of the uh, alliance of Greek city-states freeing these people if Alexander went in and sacked every Greek colony that he freed. So there's this happening in the background as Alexander's army moves through and swallows up Anatolia and takes a giant bite out of the Persian Empire. Now Persia, while this is happening, they've already lost one army. They have smaller armies that are trying to pick off components of Alexander's army. And there's battles being fought there that I talked about. But there is also more Persian money and influence. And this time the Persian navy is getting involved. And they, instead of fighting Alexander on land, go back home and try to stir up a hornet's nest and draw Alexander's army back home. So the Persian navy begins attacking the Greek colonies and islands. Sparta, at this time, starts rampaging back forth in, in Greece with their island, and Alexander is forced to send generals home with small parts of the army to try and deal with this. He'll send any money he can spare back home to help pay for mercenaries to hire to put down um, this Persian um, kind of hornet's nest that's getting kicked up jointly with Sparta. This is happening in the background, and there's conflict happening there between the Greek generals he's left in charge of Macedon and Greece, conflict between them and Olympias, who's still back home. There's, remember I told you how independent and how um, very kind of alien her attitude was culturally to the rest of Greek women and what was expected of them. Even though she's the mother of Alexander the Great, she gets a pass on a lot of things. But in the middle of a, of a civil war, where money's on the line, lives are on the line, Alexander's throne is on the line, the Greek general back home doesn't have a lot of brook for uh, Olympias and her attitude. She needs to be behind doors, seen, not heard, that type of thing. So Alexander, even though he can't send his army back home, he sends the money that he can to help buy mercenaries. But he, again, the lateral thinker, the impatient way of doing it, even though he wants to get stuck in and go right for the throat of the Persian Empire, he instead starts hitting all the port cities along the coastline of the Mediterranean, of Anatolia and down the Levant, hitting into Egypt. These are all the places the Persian ships and navy will need to go to resupply rather than go for the throat of the Persian king right away, who's without an army, Alexander has to press pause and deal with making sure his Macedonian kingdom and, al and Greek allies aren't cut off and he doesn't have his army mutiny in front of him to go back home and deal with that. So Alexander, as he splits his army up, he sends some people around Anatolia in the northern parts, consolidating there. He moves down and starts taking out all these little port cities and causing the Persian navy supply lines to get longer and longer 
and longer and they, they you know they got to go further every time they need to get more supplies more money to get messages to get troops back and forth it becomes harder and harder and harder and the macedonian greek kind of spartan civil war slowly peters out as alexander starts cutting off all these supply lines and while alexander's doing this he's going down south he's heading along the coastline of anatolia and he hits one of the cities that's kind of a famous battle and i want to stop and talk about this briefly because it's another uh, lateral thinking moment of alexander and that's the siege of tyr now i'm sure many of my listeners will be uh, or have heard of the phoenicians or the Carthaginians, which was a Phoenician colony in North Africa. The Phoenicians are a naval um, dominant civilization. They rise to prominence after the Bronze Age collapse. They take over a lot of the um, Eastern Mediterranean uh, shipping routes that the Minoans and the Mycenaeans uh, used to have control over uh, prior to the Bronze Age collapse. After the Bronze Age collapse, the Phoenician civilization, this would be centered around modern-day Lebanon. They take over the shipping lanes. They become a dominant naval uh, civilization. They're eventually conquered in parts by the uh, Babylonians and the Assyrians, you know, mes part of the Mesopotamian uh, kingdoms. They're also fighting off and on against the uh, Judean kingdoms. But regardless, the Phoenicians in our story have a reputation, even in modern times, or mo when I say modern times, modern to Alexander, contemporary to Alexander's time, a reputation of having uh, great naval uh, fortresses and are great technological and naval innovators they're a huge source of persian naval forces themselves the persians are a land-based kingdom they rely heavily on phoenician naval forces for their naval fleet so taking out the phoenicians is an important step in alexander cutting off the persian navy Tyr is one of the largest and most well-defended uh, naval ports in the Persian Empire. So uh, one of the things about Tyr is that it is an island fortress. It is an island naval base. You can see it from the mainland, from, from kind of Lebanon, but you need boats to get to it. It's one of the reasons why it's uh, so well defended and hard to conquer. But again, Alexander is A, impatient, and B, he's a lateral thinker. He solves problems in creative ways. First thing he does is the easy thing. He requests their surrender. They don't. So he says, well, uh, you know, my navy, well, my navy, the royal we, the Alexander we, his navy is mostly in the Mediterranean helping to fend off the Persian navy that's already there. So Alexander doesn't have much of a naval fleet, certainly not enough to take the island fortress and siege it, especially not against the Phoenician um capabilities of naval warfare so alexander does what any good lateral thinker will do is he says well if i can't beat you on the ocean and i can't make you leave your fortress to fight me on land i will bring the land to you so alexander's army sets up camp and while they set up camp, they head southwest, east to the neighboring cities who don't put up any fight. They capitulate, and Alexander is able to set up camp there for months while the surrounding cities feed his army. And he goes to the mountains and chops down the forest there. And while he's there, he conquers more, more people there. 
because he needs the woods. So he chops down the woods, the logs, hauls it hundreds of kilometers to the coastline. And he builds of wood and rock and earth a land bridge from the coastline of the Levant and bridges hundreds and hundreds of meters of open ocean to build a land bridge all the way to the fortress of Tyr. Now, again, I don't want to go into the, the whole battle thing. I don't want to get drug, dr- dragged into that, that thing. But, of course, you can imagine the perspective of the army and the commanders sitting in the, the island fortress of Tyr. You know, Alexander's army's way off in the distance. You can see the coastline, but, you know, it's not something you worry about. Even in low tide, it's rough seas to get anything over to their fortress. And they've got the biggest naval uh, force there. There's multiple ports. You can't really circle or lock in the army. They're feeling safe and sound. And you can imagine them um, when they start seeing the logs getting um, pushed into the ocean. When they start seeing the rocks getting pushed in, the logs getting set, you know, building the, the backbone to which they will fill in soil and rocks and more rocks and soil and logs and something that looks like a bridge of earth and rock and wood starts beginning to take shape hundreds and hundreds of meters away you got to squint to make out that you know you could see there's an army there and they're doing something you don't really know what they're doing and every day that that little smudgy land bridge gets a little closer and then you start realizing they're doing something over there and so you you send a little scout ship out and it doesn't get too close because of course the army's got archers and catapults and things like that and they'll they'll uh, pick off your boat but you get close enough you can see they're building a land bridge they've got hundreds of logs thousands of logs People are, you know, there's a slave army uh, workforce along with the army workforce building day and night, meters of progress being made daily. And every day it gets a little closer to the island. You imagine the first time they realized they were doing this, they probably had a good old laugh. Can you imagine, you know, this fortress island that's been there for hundreds of years, never been sieged successfully? And here's somebody who's just throwing a bunch of rocks and mud in the ground and hoping that um, they can eventually get there. That's what Alexander's doing. And you imagine the perspective from the Tyrians when they first saw this happening. They probably had a good long laugh. Every day they laughed until eventually it looks like that island bridge, geez, that's starting to get close. And then you start realizing that the storms that are coming, the tides, aren't really washing it away that you thought it might. Well, so now there starts to become a threat of an actual land invasion of an island fortress. Now the Tyrians, they do a few things to try and stop this. As he, you know, as he gets in range, they send naval boats out with. Um, Um, archers and things like that they set fire to the bridge they attack the workforce alexander counters by uh, basically building uh, mobile shields that kind of sit in front of the land bridge as it makes progress you can fire it all you can fire arrows and spears at it all you want not going to do anything just going to bounce off then they try to set fire to it then alexander covers it with um, you know fireproof things to kind of counter that And every day, inevitably, it gets a few meters closer. And then Alexander can start bringing his own siege weapons to bear and start pounding on the walls. And again, I don't don't want to get, here I am starting to get dragged into the battle, and I don't want to do that. But I wanted to talk about it because it shows, again, this parallel, or pardon me, not parallel, this lateral way of thinking, this solving of problems, this unique way when somebody says you're not taking my island 
And Alexander says, well, yeah, I am, and I don't need the Navy to even take your island, and I'll prove it to you. And he does. And he gives the city a thorough sacking when it happens. So this is Alexander the Great taking an island fortress via a land battle. And when he understood that he was not far from the city, he went out in procession with the priests and the multitude of citizens. The procession was venerable and in the manner of it different from that of other nations. It reached to a place called Sapha, which name, translated into Greek, signifies a prospect. For you have thence a prospect both of Jerusalem and of the temple, and when the Phoenicians and the Chaldeans that followed him thought they should have liberty to plunder the city and torment the high priest to death, which the king's displeasure fairly promised them, the very reverse of it happened. For Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance in white garments, while the priest stood clothed with fine linen and the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing, with his mitre on his head, having the golden plate whereon the name of God was engraved, he approached by himself and adored that name. The first saluted the high priest. The Jews also did all together with one voice salute Alexander and encompass him about whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at what Alexander had done and supposed him disordered in mind. However, Parmenio alone went up to him and asked him how it came to pass that, when all others adored him, he should adore the high priest of the Jews, to whom he replied, I do not adore him, but that God who hath honored him with his high priesthood. That was a quote from a historian called Flavius Josephus. He was a, a Jewish priest and later Roman slave from uh, a few hundred years in the future. But he was alive um, during the Roman destruction of Jerusalem just after you know the death of Jesus. I'm reading that book in preparation for my next series. The book is called um, Antiquity of the Jews, followed by another book written by Flavius Josephus called The Wars of the Jews, but the Jewish-Roman Wars and the various wars they fought. Uh, but I read that because in The Antiquity of the Jews, this is a historical document that Jewish historians kept of their interaction with Alexander the Great, just after Alexander finished sieging Tyr and destroying it. The Jews come out of the city. The priests are uh, dressed in their robes. Thousands of the civilians come out dressed all in white. And they meet Alexander outside the city walls. The walls are thrown open. And Alexander um, embraces the high priest, and when Parmenio, one of Alexander's generals, asks him why he would embrace this high priest, why would you, why would a king, the conqueror, hug and embrace a lesser person, a non-Greek, when all the rest of the world uh, capitulates and kneels before him? And Alexander's quote is, he's not embracing the priest. He's embracing the God. And I pulled this quote out because it's an independent description of a historical moment of Alexander uh, conquering Jerusalem. Well, not conquering Jerusalem. Jeru the Jeru city of Jerusalem just uh, surrendered to him as he was passing by. But it shows the Jewish perspective of Alexander's thinking that Alexander um, did not exalt or um, kind of entreat the high priest as an equal. He embraced the high priest because the high priest had the name of God on him. He was an emissary of a god, and as I recall from my first episode, and again in my 
second episode in the series, I talked about how important religion was to Alexander. This is an example of Alexander's respect for the religious intermediaries, the priests and the priestesses, who receive divine knowledge directly from the gods and communicate that to the rest of the people. Alexander has immense respect for those people. Well, I'm going to talk about that more in a little bit, but I wanted to read that quote to you because, again, it's another non-Greek perspective of Alexander the Great, an account of him coming through as his army is conquering the Persian Achaemenid Empire. So if you're interested in more of Flavius Josephus and his history of the Jewish-Roman Wars, I will be talking about that actually next in my next series of episodes. You can join me on that in a, a little while as we start that series up. But before we get there, I wanted to give you that list little taste because as I was doing my research into it, I came across this account that was unexpected for me. I wasn't expecting to read a Jewish account of Alexander conquering the city of Jerusalem, but it was there in that book. It was a pleasant surprise. So I made note of that quote so I could read it to you as part of my series on Alexander the Great. Another perspective of Alexander interacting with people in and around the Persian Empire. Now there's a, a few other interesting things in the uh, antiquity of the Jews from Joseph, Joseph, uh, pardon me, from Josephus Flavius, or pardon me, from Flavius Josephus, got the name backwards. Uh, but there's a few other interesting interactions about Alexander the Great and Jerusalem and the Jews. He's taking into the city itself. He's treated obviously fabulously well, fed the finest wine and food. Uh, but he's also taken into the temple. He would have been ritually purified. Nobody who was impure could set foot in the temple. This was part of Jewish law. So he would have been ritually purified and he was led through a typical Jewish sacrifice to God. So he took part in that kind of ritual offering. And he was also um, shown the holy book, the book of David, which contained supposedly a prophecy that a Greek person would eventually destroy the Persian Empire, which, of course, Alexander can't help but see himself uh, be that prophecy coming true. So a little tidbit there, little uh, third-party uh, document talking about Alexander the Great that's different from the other sources that I'm actually drawn heavily on in this series. So just a little interesting little bit of Alexander in Jerusalem. We're going to stop here this episode. I flip back and forth whether or not a multi-hour episode is something that uh, the people that listen to the show have a tolerance for. Um, you know, personally, the pause button works great. I uh, listen to stuff. I'll drive back and forth and, you know, it might take a, a day or two for me to get through some stuff. But uh, understanding that that's not everybody's cup of tea. So I'm going to try and keep at least the episodes for this series right around the, the hour mark where, you know, this one's going over a little bit. And next week, we're going to start digging more into religion and its impact on Alexander. We'll be getting into Egypt, into Babylon, into India, and those relations with the peoples there, and a little bit in between. There's a lot more people and relationships to explore, and more things to help us reveal the character of Alexander and the people that he dealt with. So join me next month as we continue our multi-part series on Alexander the Great. 
And before I let everybody go, I just want to say um, hello to all my new listeners in Sweden. Uh, as I go through this podcast, you get statistics once in a while, and every now and then I take a look at them just to see what's kind of interesting and new in, in the statistics. And at least last month, and when I say last month, I'm talking kind of January, February timeline, um, my listeners in Sweden have been uh, number three amongst all my uh, listeners in the entire world. United States being first, no surprise there. Canadians being second. Thank you, Canada, my home country. So thanks for everybody in Sweden who's listening. I just wanted to give a shout out to you. And uh, thank you for listening. And we'll keep going and tune in. And if anybody would like to reach out to me, you can reach me by email at grimdarkhistory at gmail.com. You can also say hello uh, to me on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Grim Dark History. I'm also on YouTube, also YouTube slash uh, Grim Dark History. If you're an Instagram person, I'm also on there, and I post content on there once in a while. And that's uh, Grim Dark Pod, and that's my Instagram account. So pop in, say hello, um, and uh, just let me know what you're thinking. And uh, thank you very much for listening, and we'll st tune in next month as we hop on to the next episode. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the show.